Assuming that you now have R, R Studio, and R Jags all working in perfect harmony with each other, although in my experience nothing ever works the first time, but for the moment I'm assuming everything is working just fine. Now we're ready to look at some of the example data that comes in the best folder. After we look at how the inference works in all those different sample data sets, we can then alter it and pretend like we're inserting data from our own experiments and then running it with these programs. So notice we're going to be using this best example right here. And remember that it calls upon a lot of the functions in this best folder. Okay, so best example.r and best 1g example.r are basically the equivalent of doing an independent samples in best example and a one sample in best 1g example t tests. Except in this case, we're applying Bayesian inference to the data that we've collected. So notice again, a lot of this we're not going to change but we will change things in these vectors right here. In this case, these are just placeholders, surrogates, for data that you would collect in the actual world. Now here's this kind of arbitrary data to illustrate some of the properties of Bayesian inference. So in this case, you would simply replace all these values with the values you collect. It could be behavioral reaction times, it could be percent signal change in an fMRI study, and you would just put them in here, separate them with a comma, and then run the program and would call upon all the appropriate methods and functions to run Bayesian inference on your study. It, it really is as simple as that. If you want to, again, make this more custom and change some things to suit your own evil purposes, you can do that by altering some of the code in the rest of these folders right here, specifically best.r, best1g.r, uh, HDI, these two different plotting mechanisms down here. But for the moment, I'm assuming that really uh, you're going to be fine just using a lot of the defaults that are in there already. So to run this, I'm going to click on source. Again, this is what makes RStudio very efficient, very quick, and easy to use. So if I click on that, it's basically like I just copied and pasted all the text in this file right here into my console down here. So right now, it's already run the burn-in, just like in that web app where we had the burn-in samples, which we discard, and now actually sampling the MCMC -MC chain. This takes a little while, and instead of having a really long, awkward silence, I'm just going to make the screen go blank until the MCMC -MC chain is finished sampling. All right, now that the sampling has finished, and we've built up our posterior distributions, this function also automatically plots all of these different parameter estimates for you. So notice, just like in the web application, we have different parameter estimates and also this 95% HDI, representing the density, the highest density interval, of our parameter estimates. Okay, so we have individual group mean estimates, standard deviation estimates, normality estimates, effect size, and probably what you're most interested in, since we are comparing groups, is an estimate of the difference of means. Notice that Bayesian inference is very robust against things like outliers. We can see some of the raw data plotted in these red bar histograms right here. So even though we had quite a few outliers, really that didn't affect our parameter estimate that much. And even though we had unequal group sizes, it also did not pose much of a problem. Bayesian inference was very robust against what would typically be problems for running t-tests. Okay, so that is a basically the equivalent of an independent samples t-test. Really, we're just doing Bayesian inference for a group difference of means. Okay, you also get these plots which show correlations between different parameters, which also provides you information about that. Okay, so that's that's a topic for another time, but that information is there for you to peruse if you wish. Lastly, I want to show this best 1G example. Okay, so this is basically one group. And critically here, something that we're going to want to change if you're using this for your own data, this comp val m, this is the mean that we're comparing to. So if we're basically, if we just have one group, what are we, what are we trying to compare it against? In a lot of cases, you know, if you just have the differences from a paired groups test, you might be comparing this to zero, which would basically compare it against uh, a null value, which says that there is no difference between them. So I'm going to go ahead, run the source here, let's bring in the MCMC chain, and again, I'll just take a few seconds timeout until this thing finishes. 
Okay, the sampling is now finishing up. And again, just as before, we now get some plots showing these different distributions. Okay, so notice that we now have an HDI spanning values from 101 to 102. And also, notice that this entire HDI falls well outside of a value of 100. So if we're comparing this to a value of 100, and we also had a rope just around a very narrow band of that interval right there, we can go ahead and say with confidence that our parameter estimate appears to be within this region and not include this value down here. And we also have a rope on things like different parameters such as effect size. The last thing that I want to show you guys is an example that I would apply to some, say, fMRI data. I do this all the time. So usually when I extract data from a region of interest, I now have things like signal change, okay, or parameter estimates, contrast estimates, what have you. And usually with fMRI data, you get values roughly within, say, the negative 0.1, or say, uh, negative 1 to positive 1 range. And let's say I collect the data from, uh, I think this is close to about 20 subjects, and I want to see whether this is actually different from zero. Okay, whether my parameter estimate is credibly different from zero. And not only that, but I might be interested in actually trying to see whether zero is among the credible values of my parameters, right? Now notice what I would change here is first of all, I would change all the data within this vector. I would also change confLM to zero, since that's usually what I'm trying to compare it against. And a good rope is about 0.1, or negative 0.1 to 0.1. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and run this. This is actually quite quick. So I'm just going to leave this up here. Uh, last thing, notice rope EFF, that's for the effect size, and rope M is for the mean. Okay, so again, we have here our rope, our HDI. Notice the entire HDI falls outside of the rope, suggesting that my a credible parameter value is actually well outside of this a region of practical equivalence, which I would put for a null value of zero. And lastly, also we get these plots that show correlations between parameter estimates. One more example, again with some just sample data right here, is what if we're actually trying to show that our data support a null hypothesis. Again, this is basically impossible to do with uh, traditional NHST methods. But in this case, let's say I have a bunch of values which appear to be around zero, and I establish a region of practical, practical equivalence running from negative 0.1 to 0.1. And lo and behold, my 95% HDI actually falls well within that region of practical equivalence. And in this case, I could go ahead and accept what's essentially a null value of zero. So that's how you do it. Again, very simple. You just replace what's in those vectors with the data you collect from your own experiment. And a lot of the Bayesian inference is run for you. Uh, the things that you would probably just change are things like your comparing value. So the, like the mean comparing value in the case of a, um, a one group test. And also your region of practical equivalence, which will vary from study to study. In this case, for me, I would say uh, with fMRI data, a, re a rope of negative 0.1 to 0.1 is a pretty reasonable approximation of a, a null value of zero. For behavioral reaction times, it might be very, very different. But I hope that helps. I hope this is a catalyst for people starting to use this for at least their region of interest uh, data in fMRI studies. Again, uh, very simple, very straightforward. And with R, it's becoming a much more tractable tool to use for basically any kind of study. So I hope this helps. Hope you guys will try it out, and I'll see you guys next time.